May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is a portion of the uh, Gospel lesson read earlier. I'm not going to reread the entire uh, text. It's before you in your worship folder, but it's from Matthew 20, the first verse through verse 15. Just like to read uh, verses 14 and 15 to you at this point uh, of this parable which Jesus spoke. He said, Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So far the text. In the name of Jesus, who offered one sacrifice for all sin forever. Dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true living, creating and preserving triune God. I want to call your attention to two words in this text, especially that we're going to focus on. The words are evil eye. Jesus said that this householder who hired all of these laborers for his vineyard that day used the term evil eye. Is your eye evil? What does that mean? What is the evil eye? Well, he spoke it to the laborers who had worked all day and thought that they should get more pay than the laborers who had hardly worked at all. The evil eye, therefore, that these laborers had came when they looked askance at their neighbor's good fortune. They didn't like it. That's evil. When you look at askance at another person and say, I'm jealous of him. You look askance at another person because he got something you didn't. And you're envious. And you carry a grudge against that person. That frame of mind, that jealousy, that envy, Jesus here, in the parable sense, says that you have an evil eye. That jealousy, that, that envy, that's an evil thing. When you look with your eye on what somebody else has in their good fortune, and you say, I hate that. That's the evil eye. And it's common. It's common. How common is it? It is a worldwide pandemic. It is a moral pandemic. It is everywhere. Everybody has it. Even you have it. I have it. There are no exceptions. The Bible speaks of it often. There are many examples of it in the Bible. Uh, you could start off with uh, Cain, the first baby ever born. He had it. He looked at his younger brother, Abel. Cain said, I'm jealous of him. I envy him. I carry a grudge for him. He had the evil eye towards his younger brother, Cain had of Abel. The Bible also talks about Haman. Uh, Haman was very, very blessed. He was a very favored man in uh, Persia. Uh, he was the favorite of the king, Ahasuerus. Uh, he uh, had it all. 
you might say, in today's worldly parlance. He had riches. He had respect. Everybody bowed down to him in the kingdom of Babylon. He had it all. But was he happy? No. Because one man, one man, Mordecai, a Jew, wouldn't bow down to him. And so he had the evil eye towards Mordecai. In fact, I'll read to you from the Bible what Haman said. Haman said, All this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate who will not bow to me. So he had the evil eye toward Mordecai. Didn't have his respect. Another example in the Bible is King Saul towards David. Here's Saul, greatly blessed of God, the first king of Israel, uh, chosen by God to be the first king. Uh, but was he happy? Was he thankful? No. He looked upon this young man, David, with envy and jealousy. And he held a grudge against David because David was maybe a little more popular, maybe a little bit better in battle. Maybe he was blessed by God with other things that Saul felt he didn't have. He was getting more respect from the people. David loved Saul, respected Saul, but Saul didn't return that. He returned it with hatred. And Saul hated David. Not because David had done any evil to him, but because David just seemed to be a little bit more successful. And so Saul hated David and persecuted David and wanted to kill David because Saul had the evil eye. And you have other examples in the Bible in the Old Testament. Book of Genesis. Remember how we studied that a little while ago? And you had the brothers, Jacob's sons, the brothers of Joseph. They had the evil eye toward Joseph, didn't they? Because they felt the father loved Joseph more than the other sons. That, that, that their father favored Joseph. He was the fair-haired boy, and he got the coat of many colors. And he was put in authority over the other brothers. And they hated him for it. Not because Joseph had harmed them or done anything wrong to them. But because Joseph had a couple of dreams sent to him by God. And he told his brothers these dreams that, that they, they would, would bow down to him. And they thought, oh, he's stuck up. He's conceited. He thinks he's better than us. And so they hated him. They hated him so much they threw him into a pit to die. The evil eye. It's a fundamental cause of communism. It's a fundamental cause of socialism. People get to looking at other people and say, I want what they've got. And I'm going to have a government that forces them to give it to me. Because one person possesses more money than me, I have an evil eye toward him, and I hate him. I'm jealous of him. Because one person possesses more goods than I have. I have the evil eye toward him. Or another person is more attractive than me. I have the evil eye toward him. Or because one person has a greater intellect, greater intellectual endowments than me. I carry a grudge toward him with petty things that I do to him to hurt him. Because one person is more popular than me. One person is more eloquent than me. One person is more skilled than me. One her person holds a superior position to me. Whatever it is, we have the evil eye toward him and we're jealous of him. 
and we do unkindnesses to, to him, like Joseph's brothers did to him, and like Saul did to David, and so forth. Let us beware of flattering ourselves that this malignant eye is not also in the church. In fact, this parable that Jesus told of the laborers in the vineyard is a parable of the church. That's, the, that's what it represents. The vineyard represents the church. The householder represents God. The laborers represent the members of the church. It exists even in the church, this evil eye this jealousy, this envy of other members of the church. Oversensitive members who feel others' efforts in the church are more appreciated than theirs. Oversensitive members in the church that think that other members are more recognized in the church than they are. And so but this evil eye, they, they withdraw from the church. And they say, well, if I'm not going to be recognized like these other members, I'm just not going to do anything. Jealousy and envy and grudges. The evil eye. What do we do about it? What do we do about the evil eye? Two things. First, remember in this parable, all of these laborers, all of them, were standing idle with nothing. No job, no income, nothing in the marketplace until the householder came to them and hired them. The householder chose them, not the other way around. Now the householder, as I said, symbolizes God in this parable. And the householder, or God, is under no obligation to hire us. We were standing idle. We had nothing. But the householder came to them, and so God has come to us. He was under no obligation to come to us. He didn't have to give us anything. But he chose, out of his infinite love, he chose us. He did it of his own free choice. Nothing to do with us. God, like this householder to the laborers, has brought us into this world. He gave us life. We didn't choose to be born. We didn't choose to be conceived. We didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose the time and history or the place on the face of the earth to, to live and to be born. This was all God's choosing. He was under no obligation to give us anything, but he gave us bodies and minds and eyes and ears and all our members. They're all his doing. They're all his work. His creation that he has given to us. And not only that, that once we were here, he gave us all that we have. Our appearance, our, our houses, our places to live, our clothes, our money, our goods, our health, you name it. Anything we have, it's God's choice to freely give us. He was under no obligation, as was this householder, he says to these laborers. He was under no obligation to hire them or to pay them whatever. Only what he agreed. And so it is with us and God. God has given us certain things. What talents we have, they're from God. What abilities we have are from God. But he was under no obligation to do it. And to some, he has given more. And to some, he has given less. But it's his choice. It's his things. It's all under his power. 
the important thing is to remember whether we have less or more than others, all that we have is from God. Period. And it's his gift. And so God, who is represented by the householder in this parable, he says in verse 14, I will give, and that's the key word, give, I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? It's all God's. And whatever we have, he gives us from his infinite storehouse. The Bible says, what hast thou that thou hast not received? The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, wrote, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Thus, how do you overcome the evil eye? First of all, always carry this mindset. All I have is from God. All he has is from God. All he has is from God. Every person you see, what they have is a gift of God. Now, if you're dissatisfied with that, If you are envious of that or jealous of that or carry a grudge toward that person because of that, who are you really dissatisfied with? God. You're saying, God, you made a mistake. You gave him something that you didn't give me. You're wrong, God, you are saying. You're dissatisfied with God's will. You're dissatisfied with God's ways. Because God, in his infinite wisdom, knows how best to distribute his gifts. Let none of us gainsay God's wisdom. Let none of us gainsay God's providence. God has given you, at this point in time, exactly what God thinks is best for you at this time. Learn to be content. Or as the householder says in our text in verse 14, take that is thine and go thy way. Be content with it. Know it's God's gift that he has chosen his infant wisdom to give you. First rule, to deal with the evil eye, that God has given you what you have, all of it. And he distributes his gifts as he sees fit. And be content with that. Second thing to deal with the evil eye is to remember, what does Jesus call this jealousy and this envy? Does he call it something good? Does he call it a good eye? No. He calls it an Evil eye. It's evil. Jealousy is evil. Envy is evil. Carrying grudges to people is evil. It's not good. It's not godly. It's devilish. In fact, it was the devil's first sin. He wasn't content being head angel. He wanted to be God. And so he rebelled against God in heaven and was cast out of heaven with all of the other evil eye angels that uh, rebelled against God in heaven. The very first sin was envy. It's evil. It's sin. It's of the devil. It's against the fifth commandment, which reads, Thou shalt not kill. And the, under that comes all the passages of the Bible that talk about hating other people and holding grudges toward other people because they might have something you don't. It's against the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. Because now I want, to, I want to get what he's got. I want to take it from him by force if need be. Or some other 
way. It's, it's at the root of the seventh commandment. It's, it's even mentioned in the ninth and tenth commandments, thou shalt not covet. I want what he's got. I, I got to have what he's got. And I won't be happy until I get it. There's four commandments right there. It's evil. It's sin. The Bible classifies it under the works of the flesh, along with things like adultery, murder, idolatry, drunkenness, and the like. It's one of those listed. This covetousness, this, this envy and jealousy. Now, we claim to be Christians. We claim to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior from sin, death, and hell. What kind of a mind should we have? Should we have an evil mind? Which revels in sin and, and, and doesn't repent of it? And says, yeah, I'm going to be jealous of that guy and I'm not sorry. I'm going I'm to envy that guy. I'm going to have a grudge against that guy. Christians shouldn't do that. It's not the fruit of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the flesh. Therefore, we should fight against it. We should try to avoid it. When it raises its ugly head within us, this evil eye of envy. When we look upon a neighbor's good fortune and we don't rejoice with him, we don't think, praise God. We're not being Christ like that. We should rejoice in our neighbor's good fortune, that God has chosen to give him good things. And so the Holy Ghost, if we are truly Christians, truly Christ believers, the Holy Ghost dwells within us, not the evil eye. The Holy Ghost, God dwells within us. He is to rule our hearts and minds. The Holy Ghost, in so doing, will move us to hope for our neighbor's good and to pray for our neighbor's good and to praise God when good things happen to other people, when they are blessed by God. So those are the two things to overcome the evil eye. Let everyone think seriously over this text to examine his eyesight and to ask forgiveness for our sins when we have been envious and jealous and hateful towards others because they have, we think, been treated by God better than us. Let us repent. Well, so we ask God for forgiveness. Why should he forgive us? God, I, I have sinned. I have had jealousy and envy in my heart towards other people. I have not rejoiced at their good fortune. I ask thee to forgive me. But why should he? It's evil. We've broken his commandments. Why should he forgive us? Should he forgive us because we think we've done something good to deserve it? Oh God, I... I come to you and I ask you to forgive me because, well, I'm a forgiving person myself. I, I, I forgive others. So you should forgive me. Is that why God should forgive us? No. He won't forgive us for that reason. There's only one reason. Jesus Christ. Period. It's the only reason God should forgive us. Because God is a God of justice, and every sin must be punished by being thrown into outer darkness forever. All of us who sin should be thrown into hell forever. But God in his infinite mercy and compassion and love for us poor miserable sinners, full of envy and jealousy, he came down from heaven to his created world 
and humbled himself to become a human being, born of the Virgin, so that he could live as a man in this world under the same laws and commandments that we live under, and yet keep all those laws perfectly. Jesus Christ is God, become also a true man. He is God the Son, become also the man Jesus of Nazareth. But he is a perfect man, a sinless man. He didn't inherit sin from his father. His father is God, God the Father. But he could live a sinless life, only as God could, as a man. He never envied anything in his life, in this world. He didn't envy any person anything. He was never jealous of another person. He never held a grudge against any person. He didn't hate anybody because they had more than he did. And yet, this perfect God-man Jesus took upon himself all of our envy, all of our jealousy, all of our grudges, all of our sins, and he took them to the cross. And there, our envy was paid for, our jealousy was paid for, all our hatred towards other people for no reason was paid for. In full, he shed his blood to cleanse us from all sin. That's the only reason God forgives us, because he paid the justice price for all our sins in full forever. One time, one cross, one death, and then he rose from the dead to prove it's all true. And that's the main message of the Bible. Now, there was a woman once whose name was Mary Baker Eddy. Now, she didn't believe this. She didn't believe this message of forgiveness in Christ Jesus. I'd like to read to you from this woman's writings, which you can find in the Christian Science reading rooms. She started the Christian Science religion. And this kind of sums up, I think, what Mrs. Eddy believed. Quote, One sacrifice however great, is insufficient to pay the debt of sin. The atonement for sin requires constant self-immolation on the sinner's part. That God's wrath should be vented upon His beloved Son is divinely unnatural. Such a theory is man-made, unquote. Now the Bible says of God, Now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, who are you going to believe? The Bible or Mary Baker Eddy? Let us confess our sins. Not just the evil eye, but all of our sins, which are innumerable. Especially as we come to the Lord's Supper today, we are to examine ourselves. the Bible says. Confess our sins, but not just confess them, but to ask forgiveness through Jesus Christ for all of them, and to repent of them. The Bible says, if you come to my altar, God says, if you come to my altar and you have something against somebody else, in other words, you have the evil eye towards somebody, Leave your gift at the altar and go and repent of that with that other person. <laughs> Drop the evil eye toward that other person or don't come to my altar. If you're holding a grudge against another person because he's got more than you. Drop it. 
and then come to my supper. Examine yourself, he says, and then pray that God the Holy Ghost who dwells within every believer in Christ Jesus, pray to the Holy Ghost to give you power over that evil eye and indeed over all sins. And then to be an approved laborer in God's vineyard for Christ's sake. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.